Hello everybody, welcome to my very messy studio and my art channel. My name is Mark Kompanietz and I'm a professional artist and an art professor. In this video, we're going to be looking very closely at the pen and ink drawings of one of my favorite artists, Jacques de Gain II, who is a 17th century painter and printmaker from the Netherlands. I'm going to copy one of his drawings, this very delicately rendered little frog, and then I'm going to use what I've learned to create my own drawing of the same subject. Along the way, I'm going to give you a little art history lesson, talk about the very useful practice of copying from the old masters, touch upon old master drawing materials and techniques, and as always, give you a bunch of useful tips and tricks to help you improve your ability to draw with pen and ink. Let's get started. Before we begin, let's answer this question. Why should I copy from the old masters in the first place? Well, because it's one of the best ways to learn how to draw. During the Renaissance, apprentices would begin their training by copying the work of the master, which, besides teaching them the fundamentals, allowed them to acquire the master's style and to seamlessly aid in the completion of the workshop's commissions. With the move from the apprenticeship system to the academy, the practice continued, and we have many examples of old masters copying the work of previous old masters as part of their development. Here's just one case, this wonderful copy of Michelangelo's Libyan Sibyl from the Sistine Chapel by Peter Paul Rubens, who lived about a hundred years later. I did a ton of copying when I was in art school and still do a fair amount to this day. While looking at a lot of art to aid your artistic development is absolutely crucial, nothing gives you more insight into the thought process of another artist than to copy their work. It opens up a window into the artist's mind, allowing you to see the work in a much deeper way. So, if you haven't incorporated copying into your training routine, get going on it because there is no more valuable learning tool. Also, keep in mind that copying can come in many different forms depending on what you want to learn. For example, if you want to learn how an artist constructed a composition, you might want to do a rough sketch of a painting where you limit yourself to defining the larger shapes. Or, if you want to understand how an artist dealt with a particular anatomical feature, you might want to do a detailed copy of it. If you want to understand how an artist uses materials, you might want to research what materials were used and try to find modern equivalents to them. In short, there's not one way of copying. It could be a loose approximation or it could be a detailed reproduction where you're copying the work stroke for stroke. For this demonstration, we're not going to go quite that far and do something that detailed, but we're going to get pretty close by seeing if we can replicate the look of the drawing by finding modern equivalents to the materials being used. Let's take a look at the paper used in the drawing and see if you can find something in my paper collection close to it in color, texture, and ink handling properties. The paper in the drawing has a warm gray tone to it and has lots of speckles and different colored fibers. This is because paper at this time was made from discarded rags and since cloth fibers varied in color, it resulted in a gray paper with a lot of imperfections. These variations of color give the paper a lively complexity and a much more interesting surface to draw on than papers that are made with modern manufacturing methods. This paper, for instance, made by Canson, is very similar in color, but as you can see, it has a very uniform surface, so I'm not going to use it. Canson also makes other papers that somewhat reproduce that speckled texture of old paper, but this particular paper is simply too dark in value for my purpose. This paper, made by Strathmore, is not quite the right color, but is closer in value. The problem here is that it's much too smooth and lacks that slight texture that I'm looking for. Now, fortunately, you can still find paper manufactured in the old traditional way, and I have a few sheets lying around, such as these two beautiful handmade papers from the Canadian paper mill, St. Armand. This sheet, while being a really beautiful blue, is a little bit too dark, but this one is much closer. And while it doesn't match the color of the original drawing, it is a traditional color that would have been available to artists of the period, since many papers were tinted blue to hide their original gray. Matching the texture of the paper and the way it handles ink is actually much more important than getting the exact color and value right. The paper used in the original drawing is not perfectly smooth, making the line work slightly irregular. The paper is also semi-absorbent, as we see in areas of feathering where the ink is applied very heavily. To many pen and ink artists, this might seem like a flaw in the paper, but to my mind, it's actually a benefit. Perfectly smooth, non-absorbent surfaces can make drawings look technical and cold, whereas a slightly rougher paper and one that doesn't take ink perfectly can give your drawing a sense of messy spontaneity and warmth. 
Now that we found a paper with perhaps not the same color, but a similar texture and absorbency, we have to deal with the problem of inks. This is very tricky because traditional dip pen ink, which is usually derived from natural sources such as sepia or walnut, perform very differently than modern inks designed for fountain pens. Here are all the brown inks in my collection. As with the paper, the main challenge is not to just get the color right, but to find an ink that performs in a similar way. We need to find something that feathers just the right amount when in contact with the paper, and is also semi-resistant to water. If you look at the drawing very closely, you'll see that there are a few areas of wash. My suspicion is that Degain did not mix a dilution of ink to get those washes, but rather was using a semi-water soluble ink and got the wash effect by simply brushing a little bit of water over the lines. This is a technique that I demonstrated in one of my previous videos, where you can take an ink that is semi-soluble in water and once it's dried, go over it with a wet brush, creating a wash effect. Here are color swatches for all of my brown inks, and to my surprise, one of the inks is not only closest in color to the original, but also has that semi-water resistance that I was looking for. This is sepia ink made by Rohr and Klinger, and you can see when I go over it with a little bit of water, the lines retain a little bit of crispness, but there is a little bit of residue creating a wash effect. Now that we have the paper and our ink, we have to choose a pen. This isn't easy because Degain was drawing with a quill, a pen made from a bird feather such as either a turkey or a goose. Such pens were very flexible and performed in ways that are not reproducible with modern steel or gold nibs. The only pens in my collection that perform similarly are my vintage pens. But the problem with them is that they write very wet, which is okay on non-absorbent paper, but on this semi-absorbent paper will make the lines feather way too much. Some of my modern flex pens write drier, but either don't have the flexibility or the ink flow to match the strokes seen in the original drawing. After a bit of experimenting, I settled on one of my favorite modern flex pens, the Pilot 743 FA. While it's not quite as flexible as the quill used in the original, we'll find ways to work around it. The main advantage of this pen is that it has very good control and is capable of putting down very thin lines, something that I'll definitely need to copy this little frog. Okay, we have the paper, we have the ink, and now we have a pen. Let's get to copying. I've just drawn in the general outlines of the frog using an HP pencil. And since I'm obviously going to copy the crosshatching as well, I've made a few indications here and there. One thing that immediately strikes me about the way Degain puts down his lines is that they're never uniform and always start thin, thicken in the middle, and end thin. The amount of control required to do this with every single line is considerable. But we have to remember that Degain was an engraver by training, and that's an art that required superhuman control. So for him, this was probably a cakewalk. The other thing to note is that just about every line forming the contour curves out. This is something you find Degain using in drawing the human form as well. And in fact, it's a fundamental rule of life drawing. The human body is composed of outwardly curving shapes, and while I can't speak for all animals, this rule most likely applies to all vertebrates. The reason for this is anatomical, since muscles and fat tissue have a tendency to press outward. And while there will be exceptions in places, areas where skin sags or is stretched between two points, drawing outwardly curving lines will give your drawing of frogs, humans, and other animals a greater sense of anatomical accuracy and solidity. I'm really enjoying the energetic bounciness of Degain's line work. He never puts down a long monotonous line and instead employs short curved lines to define the contours. Think of it as violin music with very long notes produced by a full draw of the bow versus a piece of music composed of short staccato notes. The long notes tend to be less energetic sounding whereas short sharp notes produce music that is more frenetic. This rhythmic combination of short curved lines produces a very lively dance-like rhythm throughout the drawing. And I think this is why, even though this frog is probably dead, it looks like it's still full of energy and about to leap off the page. Now that I've completed the contours, it's time to start hatching. This is where things get tough. While I was able to copy the line work with some precision, I'm not going to be able to copy the hatching stroke for stroke. The best I can achieve is to approximate the size, curvature, width, and direction, and hope it gets close enough. 
What's interesting about the hatching here is that Degain mostly keeps it in one layer, relying on the thickness of the hatching to go darker. This is something that I generally don't do, since I like to gradually build a value with multiple layers of hatching. The other thing to notice is Degain is constantly varying his strokes and considering their position much more carefully than I do. I feel like in this drawing, the position of each hatch matters and contributes to the final effect. As with the contours, there's not a single straight line here, and again, the bouncy continuum of curves is part of what makes this drawing so lively. While I'm hatching away, let's talk a little about who Jacques de Gain the II was and why this is probably the first time you're hearing about him. Jacques, also known as Jacob, was born in Antwerp in 1565 and trained under his father, who was an engraver. As a young man, he moved to Harlem, where he studied with a prominent engraver and painter Hendrik Golzius. In the 1590s, he moved to Leiden, attracting the patronage of wealthy and aristocratic clients. Around 1600, he abandoned engraving and turned to painting, continuing to enjoy royal patronage, until his death in The Hague in 1629. His son, Jacques de Gain III, was also an artist, but sadly, his fame seems to have been limited to the fact that he was a colleague of Rembrandt and had his portrait painted by him. As to why, despite the brilliance of his drawing, he's not very well known, I think this has to do with historical circumstance. De Gain is a transitional figure between the northern mannerist style prevalent in the Netherlands in the second half of the 16th century and Dutch realism, the style made famous by the likes of Rembrandt, Vermeer, and Hals. There's a reason why most artists would struggle to name even one representative of Northern Mannerism, but would be able to list off at least five from the Dutch Golden Age. The Mannerist style is, well, exactly that, mannered, and de Gain's paintings feel very contrived and unnatural. Perhaps it's wrong of me to paint an entire artistic period with such a broad brush, but artists of the time seem to be focused on imitating the achievements of the Renaissance rather than seeking inspiration from nature, resulting in a style that just feels artificial. Sadly, de Gain's engravings also suffer from the detrimental influence of mannerism. Though I appreciate the technical virtuosity required to create such work, there's nothing memorable about the overall composition or rendering in his engravings. It's really in his drawings that de Gain shows us his true power of invention and technical brilliance. Royal patronage, I think, came at a price, and I believe that de Gain's full potential was stymied by the stylistic restrictions of the time. It was only in his drawings, done in the privacy of his studio, likely only for his own interest, that his full potential could flower. Many of these drawings are studies from nature, such as these playful drawings of mice that are ready to scurry off the page once they're done posing. We also have a number of studies of other little animals, such as this page, which has another wonderfully rendered frog. This page of figure drawings shows de Gain's brilliance at drawing the human form in pen and ink. I believe the drawing in the center is what first attracted my attention to him. The sensitivity and naturalism of the figure, combined with a dazzling display of cross-contour hatching, is really unparalleled, and something I strive to achieve in my own work. Since paintings are what hang on museum walls, and are really the arbiter of fame, de Gain will always be an obscure figure. But hopefully I can do a small part in making his drawings better known. Because it is here that we see de Gain's sprightly wit, his deep sensitivity, and technical virtuosity that place him as a worthy predecessor to the towering achievements of the Dutch Golden Age. Let's get back to talking about the drawing and examine de Gain's hatching methods. Most of the hatching has been done in a single layer, with only a few places having a second layer. Instead, the value is built up by the weight of the hatching and the touches of wash that were probably applied at the end. This is very different from my hatching technique, where I sometimes use up to five layers of light hatching to build up my values. De Gain is much bolder, going dark right away with his very first application of hatch. It would be interesting to try this in my own work, but I suspect why he's able to do this so successfully is because the hatching here is not only functioning to reinforce the form and the value, it's also su suggesting the rough texture of the frog's skin. This kind of rough treatment probably wouldn't work in the figure, and in fact, de Gain's very few examples of figure drawing, his hatching is much more delicate. Another surprising thing is de that de Gain wasn't particularly consistent in the distance between the hatch marks. In my tutorial on cross-contour hatching, I recommend keeping the distances between your hatch marks consistent, because if you don't, it often breaks the illusion of hatch and turns the hatching into texture. However, in this case, the hatching actually does represent the texture, so the inconsistency here is not problematic. 
Another interesting inconsistency is that Degain uses crosshatching in only two places, on the side of the frog and in the cast shadow under the arm. Everywhere else, he applies the second layer in the same direction. This type of parallel hatching is usually done with very fine hatch marks, but here the line weight is very strong, resulting in a slightly messy effect. Once again, I think this is to emphasize the rough texture of the skin. But there are actually quite a few places that feel messy if you look at them closely, such as the cast shadow underneath the frog, which is composed of very dark, thick hatching and an impatient, often squiggly line. Degain is perfectly capable of being neater in his penmanship, so my guess here is that he deliberately left certain parts of the drawing loose and messy to give the drawing a light, improvised look. I'm finishing up the drawing here, and I'm starting to put in some of the darker accents. The line variation in this drawing is incredible. Lines that are super thin, super thick, but also lines that are lighter in value, perhaps because Degain diluted the ink to make them. Flexible metal nibs were only developed in the 19th century, so in this drawing, Degain is working with a pen made from a goose feather or another large bird. The quill pen here, when cut correctly, is really superior to any modern metal nib. I have some experience drawing with a quill pen, and there's really nothing like it. A well-cut pen glides across the paper and has a wonderful flexibility to it. The problem is that making a quill pen is quite an elaborate, multi-step process involving cleaning, soaking, drying, and curing. Then, once the quill is prepared, you still have to cut it properly, which requires a lot of practice. I'll have to do a tutorial on it at some point. My fountain pen, the Pilot 743 FA, did a fine job of reproducing many of the effects here, however. By the way, you don't need anything as expensive as this pen to do a copy like this. I have quite a few tutorials on cheaper flex pen options on my channel. Now that the drawing is almost complete, the last step is to get that wash effect by brushing some of the hatching with water. This is a very risky procedure and shouldn't be done unless you know exactly what kind of ink you're using and how it performs on your paper. This is why I did a little experiment and made sure that I would get the effect I was looking for. I dried off my water brush a little so that it wouldn't get too wet and went over the desired areas. Perhaps because the paper was a little darker than the original, the wash wasn't strong enough at first, so I went over the hatching a few more times and even added a little bit of ink in some places. The final effect was very similar to the original drawing with a delicate wash and a tiny bit of blurring of the lines without much loss of clarity. Here is the finished drawing. Not quite as good as the original, but copying such pen and ink work is pretty difficult, and this exercise could have been repeated a few times to get an even better result. Now I'm going to try to apply some of the things I've learned by doing my own version of a frog. This, to my mind, is the next logical progression in the practice of copying. Copying by itself can be a mindless exercise where nothing is learned if you don't think about what strategies were being used by the master to create the image and how those strategies can be applied to your own practice. And there's no better way to test your understanding of those strategies than to try to do an original work using that master's style. In this case, through the magic of photography, I was able to choose an image of a living frog, though I tried to find something that was somewhat similar to the pose in the original. Now that the frog is penciled in, I'm starting to ink. Let's go over some of the lessons I feel I learned from Degain's frog. The first is how much line variation there is in his hatching. While I tend to focus on line variation in the contour, and then make my hatching more or less uniform in line weight, Negain plays with line variation throughout. One of my favorite passages is the one running across the side of the frog, where the lines get wonderfully thick. My pen didn't quite get the thickness of the line here, but I still managed to reproduce the effect. As I mentioned, one of the reasons why Degain was able to use such thick hatching is because it suggested the rough skin texture. So I don't think this method of hatching will be applicable everywhere. However, I'm curious to see if I can employ more line variation in my own work and also keep the number of layers of the hatching down to a minimum to, let's say, no more than three. Another lesson is that sometimes a paper that is not entirely suitable for pen and ink can add a sense of charm and spontaneity to your drawings. Paper with a rougher texture that creates a rougher line, or a paper that makes the ink feather slightly, can make your drawings feel warmer and less mechanical. This particular handmade paper is relatively expensive and hard to obtain, so I don't think I'll be using it regularly for drawing. But it does make me want to seek out less expensive papers with similar qualities. 
The most important lesson here, however, is that the gain is not as systematic or precise as the first impression of this drawing might suggest. Under close examination, there are plenty of areas where he's very loose to the point of even being sloppy, but this in no way harms the drawing, but rather gives it energy and warmth. This lesson is important because it teaches us not to stress over a few missed lines here and there because they will not necessarily make the drawing worse. So, while we should always be striving for that unattainable perfection, we should also learn to relax and not to shed tears over small mistakes. Since the paper I'm using here was a little bit darker than the original, I decided to add a little bit of white ink. Here I'm using a Twisby Eco filled with Deatramentus White, a wonderful waterproof ink. If you'd like to know more about it and the many ways it can be used, please see my review of it on my channel. Though Degain never used this technique in any of his drawings, adding a touch of white ink onto tone paper was a very common way of working at the time. It's also one of my favorite ways of using pen and ink, which if you haven't tried, you definitely should. Here is my final drawing. Not as good as my copy of Degain, but part of it was his choice of subject matter, which was much more dynamically posed than mine. I'll be on the hunt for a better frog reference and see if I can make a better drawing. And you should too. I think much can be learned from doing a copy of Degain's frog, and I strongly recommend you give it a try. Okay everybody, well, I hope you found this demonstration useful, and if you did, hit subscribe and let me know. Also, don't hesitate to let me know what kind of videos you'd like to see from me in the future. My plan is to dedicate a lot more time to this channel in the next coming year, expand the breadth of content on it to appeal to a larger audience, and see how popular this thing can get. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>